Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jackson, members of the board, for this wonderful honor. Um, President Jackson, members of the board of trustees and the faculty, my fellow honorons, graduates, graduates, congratulations, graduates, family members, relatives, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Congratulations to all of you graduating today. You've made it through the rigors of a superb university and leave it today to conquer the world. Thank you to the trustees and the faculty for the honor you have given me. And particularly, thank you to Dr. Jackson, whose stewardship of this university has brought it international prominence. I have been privileged to know her since her arrival here 20 years ago. She is an American treasure and a remarkable leader. I confess that I am a most unlikely candidate to receive an honorary degree from Rensselaer. I am not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. I'm not even a physician, although I have learned a good deal about medicine, having led an academic medical center for a quarter century. I am, alas, a lawyer. But now I can confidently tell you that I have achieved the best of all possible worlds, an education from Notre Dame and a degree from RPI. <laughs> In the few minutes that I have this morning, I don't want to talk about those disciplines. I want to talk about optimism. I'm a child of the 60s. When I was just a bit younger than today's graduates, I lived through the end of the monochromatic 1950s, a time of Cold War and the serious threat of nuclear exchanges. And I exulted as America burst into the vibrant colors of the presidency of John Kennedy. This elegant and urbane man convinced me that there was little that we could not accomplish, that our extraordinary years were immediately ahead of us, that the time had come for us to do for our country. There was optimism to spare, and I certainly inhaled as much of it as I possibly could. Then, in only 1,000 days, it was over. An assassin's bullet left the nation stunned and shattered. Could we find our democracy and its values again? Would optimism ever return? Much that followed in the next decade should have answered that question with a firm, no, those times are now over. Consider, there was a war in Southeast Asia that raged, ultimately taking the lives of 58,000 Americans of my generation and two million Vietnamese. We could not understand what that war was about. We certainly did understand how deep our trouble was when, in a protest over the war, young American soldiers took up arms against young American students at Kent State University in Ohio, killing three of the four of the students and seriously injuring nine others. There was a theft and publication of a document we called the Pentagon Papers. No WikiLeaks here, just plain old journalism. Those papers told us that our government had been lying to us about the reasons for that war and of the unlikely prospects of ever winning it. There was a third-rate burglary at a hotel named Watergate planned by the closest advisors of, of the President of the United States. This was followed by years of investigations, congressional hearings, an impeachment process, and the resignation ultimately of the President before he could be removed from office. There was the assassination of our great, remarkable civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and our equally great presidential candidate, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, brother of the slain president. All this chaos and so much more took place in a single decade, 1964, to 1974, 
How in God's name could we ever regain our optimism? Perhaps worse, could we even save our country? Here's how we did it. Men and women who were exactly your age decided that we were going to take our country back. It started with a fight for civil rights, for those who had been continuously denied the fundamental freedoms of our Bill of Rights. We protested, we marched, some died, many were injured, but we would not give up. We fought that unjust war and stopped President Johnson from seeking re-election. We fought for voting rights for the disenfranchised. We fought for women's rights. We fought for gay rights. And by the time President Nixon resigned his office, we had not won every battle. Indeed, many of them still go on today. But we did put the country back on a moral course. We established that my generation was one to be contended with. And yes, slowly, sometimes agonizingly slowly, optimism did return. We made that happen. I'll conclude by trying to apply my life's lesson to today. I'm fully aware that irrespective of politics, in the last few years we have been subjected to an assault not only in our common senses, but also at times in our precious democracy. Making matters worse, the talking heads of the 24-hour news cycle routinely suggest that we are in terrible shape as a nation, that we are approaching a point of no return. Not only have I heard that all before, but this nation has, as I've tried to tell you, lived through times that were so much worse. Compared to those times, what we are living through today is drama. It's exhausting for sure, and it is not funny, but it is drama nonetheless. Can we still be optimistic for the future? Don't be silly. Be optimistic. There are more women running for president today than have ever run before. Be optimistic. There are more men and women of minority communities running for president today than ever before. Be optimistic. Proportionately, there are fewer really old white men running for president today than ever before. Be optimistic. There's a bright, young, gay mayor of South Bend running for president, and that has never happened before. <laughs> Cause for optimism, of course, but I caution you this way. Optimism itself won't get us where we need to be. Inertia is the cruelest of all sins. You are going to have to get involved in your country the way my generation did. Get off your backsides. Leave here today and get involved in your country. Support someone whose message resonates with the message in your head and in your heart and take this nation back. I ask you to do that, and as you do, remember the hymn of my generation, whose words remain forever embedded in my very being. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome one day. Remember the hymn of all generations. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. God bless you and God bless America.